written by Probs Not a Shill. I rubbed my eyes and yawned. For some reason, I lifted the thermos to my mouth like I didn't know it was already empty. Even after downing the whole thing, I felt exhausted, like I hadn't slept in days. I placed the thermos back into the cup holder, fixing my gaze firmly on the straight, dark road ahead. Suddenly, the screen of my car lit up, signaling I had an incoming call. I saw it was Mikey, so I answered. You staying awake back there, mate? He asked in a chipper voice. I rolled my eyes, but laughed. He was always in an infectiously good mood. Yeah, man, just barely. How did you convince me to help you move house in the middle of the night again? I heard him chuckle on the other end of the line. He knew I could never say no to him. We'd been friends for so long. It had always been me and Mikey, ever since we were kids. Hey, if you want company, I just stopped for petrol, and there's a hitchhiker out front of the station. He seemed like a nice guy, and said he was heading out our way. Mikey, there are always hitchhikers at that spot, and they usually look pretty weird. I know it seems rude, but I always kind of assume those guys must be crazy. I mean, who would get into a car with a stranger in the middle of the night? Come on, man, he pleaded. This guy seems pretty cool. He, he even said he'd help us move my stuff if we took him all the way there. I would have taken him myself, but my car is totally packed. Besides... He paused, and I could tell he had a shitty grin on his face. I already told him you'd give him a lift, so you'd seem like a total asshole if you didn't. I sighed. Mikey could be such a jerk, but he had a point. Both our cars were almost completely full, and we'd already had a van packed with furniture waiting for us when we arrived. If this hitchhiker really wanted to help, it could be worth it. After another ten minutes of driving, I pulled up to the service station, and sure enough, there was a group of guys huddled together out front smoking. I was annoyed. Mikey had only mentioned one person. There was no way I could fit anyone else in the car. I rolled my passenger side window down and yelled, Hey, is uh, one of you guys looking for a ride up to West Point? A member of the group looked in my direction excitedly. He threw his cigarette down, picked up a big backpack, which was on the ground next to him, and waved goodbye to the others. As he walked up to the car, I saw he was a young kid, probably no older than 21. Hey dude, thanks for the ride. I'm heading up to West Point, yeah. Great, I said as he hopped in the passenger seat. Sorry about the mess in the back seat. You'll have to put your backpack between your legs. No worries, I'm just happy someone finally came past. It's been a pretty quiet night, he replied eagerly. We fell into a bit of an awkward silence after that. I'm a pretty shy guy, usually keeping to myself as much as possible. Honestly, I'm no good at conversation, especially small talk. Luckily, he seemed happy to just stare out the side window. We were entering a forest now with a full moon lighting up our surroundings. It was turning out to be a tranquil drive. As we continued the trip, I noticed that further up ahead there was a road sign that looked completely different than the usual ones you see dotting the landscape. It was huge, probably at least 20 feet high, and completely black. Illuminated by a bright light on the front were massive white block letters which read, Public Service Announcement Beware of dangerous hitchhikers in the area. I shifted in my seat and glanced over at the hitchhiker I had just picked up, feeling a little worried. That was a weird sign. I've never seen one like it around here before. I said, trying to not sound nervous. He looked back over at me and said, Sorry, I didn't see anything. I've just been staring out the side of the car. What did it say? Never mind, I replied, gripping the steering wheel a little tighter. He shrugged, turning his head back out the window. 
As I stared out at the road, I swore I caught him looking over at me out of the corner of his eye. After that, the atmosphere in the car was tense. How could he have not seen the sign? It was the only thing we'd passed aside from trees in almost an hour. If he had seen it, why was he playing dumb? I know that sometimes I'm prone to being a little paranoid, but the whole situation seemed off. I could tell I was starting to get overwhelmed, so I tried to calm myself down. I reasoned that maybe he had seen the sign, but didn't want to acknowledge it because it could lead to an uncomfortable conversation. Obviously, I had no reason to suspect he was the one it was referring to. He seemed like a nice kid. I decided not to bring it up, and just kept on my guard. I jumped back in my seat a little when the car's screen lit up. I saw it was Mikey calling again. I remembered that he was only a little further up on the road and calmed down a little. If anything went wrong, he wasn't far away. I plugged my headphones in and answered. Mikey, how's it going, man? At the sudden sound of my voice, the kid spun around and looked at me in confusion. I gave him a weak grin and pointed to my headphones. He nodded and turned back to look out the window. Have you been listening to the radio at all? Mikey stammered, sounding worried. No, we've just been enjoying the peaceful drive. I responded, conscious that the kid was sitting next to me. I ended up picking up that hitchhiker you mentioned. It's been good to have some company. When I said that, the kid glanced over at me strangely and started to drum his fingers on the dashboard in front of him. Oh shit, you picked him up? I could hear an uncharacteristic hint of fear in his voice. Look man, I think that was a mistake. I just heard on the radio that the police think there's a serial killer in the area who's posing as a hitchhiker. They gave a description of him, and it sounds exactly like the kid I spoke to. If he's in there with you, do not react to this at all. You can't let him know. It took every ounce of willpower I had to keep myself from visibly panicking after I heard this. Of course, internally, all alarms were pounding at full volume. Oh, cool, dude. Yeah, good idea to meet up at the next petrol station. I could use another coffee. I responded, trying to keep the fear which was building inside me from spilling out into my voice. Stay on the line, but pretend you've hung up. Mikey said, clearly just as freaked out as I was. I stopped just a bit further up the road. Pull over when you see me and we'll deal with him together. Alright, bye dude, see you soon. (laughs) I said with a forced laugh, trying to make it seem like he'd told a joke. The kid turned to me and it seemed like he had a strange look in his eyes, like he could sense I knew something was off. So, who was that you were talking to? He asked. Oh, that was just Mikey. I responded, masking my fear with a pathetic attempt at a smile. He's the guy you spoke to at the petrol station earlier. At this, the kid reached for his bag, seemingly out of instinct. Hey, you know what? Would you be able to let me out of the car here? I might just walk the rest of the way. I was shocked by how brazen he was being. I could see he was fidgeting with the zip of his bag. I knew he had a weapon in there. I pictured him driving a knife deep into my neck as soon as I stopped the car, doing a poor job of pretending to be casual about the situation. I muttered, You can't walk from here. It's probably five or six hours on foot to the nearest town. And besides, if you get out, who's going to help Mikey and I move all this stuff into his new house? I pointed my thumb towards the back seat. The kid turned to look behind him, then back at me, exclaiming, Look, dude, you're really starting to scare me, okay? I never spoke to any driver at the petrol station back there, and I'm not sure why or how I'd help someone move all these old newspapers and magazines into a house. At this point, I was completely dumbfounded. 
he was acting like I was the insane one. I knew that I must be in the car with a complete psychopath. I decided to try and bide my time until we made it up to Mikey. I was hoping he wouldn't try anything given that we were driving at such a high speed. Trying to placate him, I said, Okay, mate, no worries. Like I said, we're coming up on another station, so I'll let you off there. He seemed to relax a little at this. He probably thought he'd tricked me by acting so frightened. I admit he'd done a good job. If I had known better, I would have thought he really was just a terrified kid. I saw that we were approaching another road sign up ahead. It was the exact same as the last one, only this one read, Kill him before he kills you. The sign's right. Mikey said in my ear. I'd almost forgotten I was still on the phone with him. You're gonna have to pull over now and deal with him yourself. I'm too far away. Don't worry. Remember, you have that hammer underneath your seat. I knew Mikey and the sign were correct. This was a dangerous situation for me and I had to act quickly. Okay, I said, turning to face him with as big a grin as I could muster. Come to think of it, maybe I will let you out here. I don't actually think there's another petrol station for a while. Sure thing. The kid responded, still doing a good job of acting afraid. He picked up his bag and held it tightly to his chest. I knew that I would have to keep acting naturally so I could surprise him once we'd stopped. I pulled over to the side of the road and parked the car, turning to him. Sorry I couldn't take you all the way to West Point, but I'll just let you out here. Sure. Thanks for taking me this far, he murmured while pulling open the door. He quickly climbed out. Before he could try anything, I reached under my seat and grabbed the hammer. After he saw this, he screamed, dropped his bag, and took off into the woods. He obviously wasn't expecting me to fight back. I got out after him and bellowed a triumphant scream of my own. Luckily, I was at least a foot taller than him and a lot quicker, so I caught up pretty easily. He must have left his weapon in the bag, which he'd been stupid enough to drop, so he couldn't put up much of a fight. <coughs> After I hit him from behind the first time, he folded over and crumbled into the dirt. I flipped him towards me and drove the hammer into his skull. I wasn't going to become just another victim. I hit him a few more times for good measure. After it was all over, I walked back to the car in a daze. When I sat back in the driver's seat, I remembered I was still on the phone. Mikey, did you hear all that? I took that psycho out before he could get me. I'm just about to start driving now, but I'll see you soon. There was no response. But I figured he was probably celebrating the good deed I'd done. I smiled, feeling like a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I couldn't wait to see my best friend Mikey again. Written by Visceral I don't know why I'm saying this or who this would even be addressed to, but here we are. My grasp on who I once was is slowly slipping away from me. I no longer have a sense of self. All I have is torment. This life seems stable enough to get out my thoughts and solidify them in my breaking psyche. I must remember who I am. I can't let it win. This man seems to be some sort of hermit. He lives in a secluded cabin. I just can't place where, as I can't recognize the language of the books on his shelf. He seems to keep himself busy just by sustaining himself. He has a hunting rifle, there's enough chopped wood to last an entire winter, and his pantry is filled with jars of preserves. I'm writing in a notebook that I found on his bedside table. 
I hope that he won't mind me using up his pages for this, but I can't even know if any of this is real. The cold is harsh on his frail body. The wind blows right through it, shocking his heart and rattling his bones. I start a fire to calm the shaking. I can't hear the crackling of the logs, I can only feel their radiating warmth. I close my eyes and let the heat wash over him. I haven't felt the sensation of warmth in many lives. I can't let myself get distracted much longer. I don't know when or if I'll get this opportunity again. My name is Alan Fisher. I am 31 and I have a wife and son. My wife is named Mary. I can't remember her maiden name. My son is named Jacob and he had recently turned four. I've been living in this nightmare for it least a few months by now. I think that it's been less than a year, but I'm not sure. Time hasn't been linear for me anymore. The one thing that I'll never forget is when I saw it for the first time. Everything started during one of my nightly jogs. They weren't lying when they said that having a kid takes away all your time during the day so the only exercise I could get was at night. I was going through my usual routine, probably listening to a podcast when about at the halfway point I saw it. It was in the shadows so I couldn't get a good look at it, but it was there, staring at me. I took out my earbuds and just stood there, unsure of what I should do. I'm fairly well built, so I don't get intimidated easily, but this was different. At one moment it seemed to be someone tall and lanky, but then at the next it seemed to be an animal on all fours. I couldn't get a firm grasp of what I was looking at and my brain was screaming at me to run, but I was petrified. When my thoughts came back to me, I tried rationalizing it, suggesting to myself that it was perhaps a mountain lion that had strayed too far from the woods at the edge of the neighborhood. But then it started ringing. The strikes of a grandfather clock tore through the silence and sent reverberations throughout my body. My ears wouldn't stop ringing and my vision tunneled. My legs buckled under me and the taste of iron filled my mouth. After a moment of disorientation, I spit out the pooling blood and managed to turn away. I had to get away from this thing. I uprooted my foot and started to run away, but as soon as the sole of my shoe struck the ground, the almost deafening ring blasted through the air and knocked me over. I blacked out the moment my head hit the concrete. Ever since, whenever I lose consciousness, I wake up in a different body, in a completely different life. I haven't once been back to my own. Different countries, different times, different people, all indiscriminately. I've lived through most of the major conflicts, disaster, and vile musings of man. I've had bliss and beauty stripped away from me with no hope of resistance. I've been built up and torn down so many times that I'm unsure if I'm even human anymore. At this point, I would have been numb to it if that damn thing just left me to my suffering. But no, I am its puppet. It is my master. If I disobey, it corrects my behavior in the way it knows best. It makes my next life more hellish than the last. I learned my lesson last time, when I woke up chained in a basement, hearing labored steps descend the stairs, in the same cadence of a clock striking midnight. I can't even take the rifle above the mantle and blow my brains out. I have no escape from this nightmare. 
I don't know what else I can do. I don't know what this thing wants with me. I apologize for every time I've said I hated my life. I would settle for any life at this point. I need something again. I need help. Please, if anyone hears this, help me. I drop the pen as tears flow down my face and drip onto the paper. The ink smudges. I cover my eyes with the unfamiliar palms and drown in my despair. The only respite being that I have the time to process everything for once. I have lost track of the time while I've been talking as the fire has long gone out and the sun has set. I suddenly feel the weight of my body pressing down against the chair and my movements in the man's body become sluggish. I feel the cold fingers of sleep fluttering across my eyelids, dragging them closed. As I shuffle towards the bed in the corner of the room, I hear the echoes of the clock striking in the distance, tearing once more through the silence. Written by Casey Ware Alien. This is an official transcription of the note found among Patient Zero's personal effects, located at the North End Military Hospital. My body hasn't always been the most healthy. Somehow, in creating me, the universe decided to pick from a buffet of genetic conditions for me, and it didn't really skimp out. From dislocating joints to a mild seizure disorder, I would be a prime candidate for frequent flyer miles at any hospital. You can't say I was terribly shocked when I started having weird symptoms. Between the medical problems I knew about and the medications I was on, I figured feeling drained all the time was normal. The same feeling of expected normalcy hit when I started losing more hair, getting cold easily, being irritable, and even forgetful. A healthy body can only handle so much, so being aware of my body's disadvantages, it didn't take me long to sweep my symptoms under the rug. That was until I was showering a few days ago and found a lump in my neck. It wasn't huge, but after following the same bathing ritual for 20 years, it was something I noticed when my hand grazed the little knot. It was probably no bigger than a dime. I do get sick easily, and it was allergy and flu season, so while I made note of it, it wasn't hard to brush it off as a swollen lymph node. I had already reached my max tolerance for hospitals this month, but I promised myself that if it got bigger, I would call the doctor. Little did I know that call would happen sooner rather than later. A couple days later, I was getting ready for bed and was brushing my teeth. I was staring in the stained and cracked mirror, questioning the life choices that led me to such a shithole apartment when I noticed the lump again. This time it was bigger. I could see it without having to strain my neck. My lovely little lump had grown to the size of a strawberry, and as I was staring in the mirror, I could swear I could see it move. Being in my perpetually exhausted state, I managed to convince myself that it was just because I was fixating on it. One of those situations where you stare at something so long that your eyes start playing tricks on you. Shaking my head, I resolved to call my doctor in the morning. After a restless night's sleep and sitting on hold with the receptionist for two hours, I managed to secure an appointment with my primary care doctor, 
who I'm sure was just as thrilled to be seeing me again as I was her. The waiting room was small, and while it was dated, it was orderly. I sat in one of the plastic chairs waiting for her to call me back, and I found myself lost in the photos and certificates on her wall. She had been a doctor longer than I had been alive. Her awards were numerous, as were the different program certificates hanging on the wall. She had done so much in the medical field, and I could never understand why she stayed in such a hole-in-the-wall town when she clearly had the skills to be leading a top-level hospital or research team. While I was musing over the different thoughts running through my head, the nurse called me back. I had only just sat down in the tiny room when the door flung open. So, Taylor, what are we seeing you for today? Medication change? Dislocated shoulder? Did you have a seizure again? She asked, glancing at me over her golden wireframe glasses. Well, no, I said as my hand instinctively started rubbing my neck. You see, I found this weird lump on my neck, and it's getting bigger. It's actually grown in just a few days, and it's starting to hurt. She put her clipboard down and walked over to me, tilting my head back. She was staring intently as she reached out to touch it, and as soon as she did, she recoiled as I shrieked in pain. It felt like my skin was ripping apart, being stretched to its limits, and her gentle touch was almost enough to destroy it. The lump on my neck felt like it was pulsating and throbbing, with no sign of relenting. This woman had been my primary care doctor for years, and had seen every injury and embarrassing medical issue I had ever had. This was the first time I saw fear in her eyes. When she noticed me staring at her, she quickly looked away. I'm going to order a preliminary ultrasound and an ultrasound guided biopsy once we identify where the mass is coming from. I'm also starting you on a steroid to help with the swelling. If the swelling goes down, then your pain should too. My nurse will call you to confirm your appointments. And with that, she was gone. As I was leaving, I could hear her on the phone, talking in a hushed and frantic whisper. It was weird, but I figured it was probably some personal matter. I barely made it to my car when the nurse came running out after me. She handed me a paper and explained that my doctor had called in some favors after seeing how painful this lump had become and I would have my ultrasound and biopsy the next day at our local military hospital. By the time I picked up my prescription and returned home, my neck and throat were screaming at me. I tried to take my steroids for the day, but it felt like there was a tennis ball in my neck, and I could barely swallow. Hell, even swallowing my own spit was an agonizing chore let alone a massive pill in water. I did my best to ignore the pain. As I finished my day and once again getting ready for bed, I found myself in front of the mirror. I stood there in shock and horror, staring at my neck. Not only had this lump grown, it had grown into my jawline and down into my collarbone. Thick, dark, purple veins were extending out of it and crawling along my chest and face. I stared in shock as it was pulsating, radiating pain through my neck and body. I reached up to touch it and barely made contact when it spasmed and dropped me to the floor in pain. I laid there for hours, drifting in and out of sleep, waking, screaming every time this thing so much as twinged. In the morning, I didn't even look in the mirror. Terrified of how people would react, I carefully wrapped a scarf around my neck, 
wincing in pain every time the fabric touched it. I didn't even get to finish checking in before the nurse whisked me away. As I was in the room putting on the tissue paper thick white gown, she gently knocked on the door. She said she was going to start an IV, that given my pain levels, they were going to give me some medication for the pain and something to dull my anxiety. Cool. Right on, I could totally get behind some drugs at that point if it meant dulling the violent, stabbing pain in my neck. I mean, I couldn't swallow anyway, so what harm was an IV going to cause if it helped get this done and over with? At this point, the lump in my neck was so large, I couldn't move my head down to watch what she was doing. However, I did see her reaction out of the corner of my eye. As soon as her needle pierced my vein, it was like the most unholy sulfuric smell hit the air. She started coughing and gagging and waving her hands in the air, trying to dissipate the smell. Her eyes grew wide and panicked as she worked. But even through the smell and whatever she was seeing, she got the job done. As she ran out of the room, I could hear her violently retching in the hallway. It was right about then that the drugs hit. I can vaguely remember being wheeled in for the preliminary ultrasound and hearing the noises of the nurses and ultrasound tech gasp in shock. I remember the cold gel on my neck and a scream as the wand hit the floor. The next time I woke up, I was surrounded. A large man with a face shield was leaning over me as the pain started. Next to him was a petite nurse holding an ultrasound wand to my neck, giving him gentle instructions on how to direct the needle in his hand. I screamed. My head was strapped down and I could see the needle resting against my chin as it edged closer and closer to the mass. I started thrashing and swinging as the needle was pushed up and down. The doctor tried to work quickly, but the pain kept getting worse. He wiggled the needle as I swung, making contact with the nurse who was holding the ultrasound wand. When he jumped, the needle somehow snapped, lodging itself in my neck as sour black liquid began to squirt in the air. My screams soon intertwined with the yelling of the doctor and the pleading of the nurses. His shield was soon doused in the liquid and it looked to be steaming. Two large men came in and grabbed me by my arms. The last thing I remember before they injected me with a sedative was the doctor's face shield melting. The gentle beat of the heart monitors woke me as they chimed in rhythm with the pulsating in my neck. I was in a new room. That's where I am now. The room is shockingly sterile. There is no TV, no chairs or cabinets, just the bed I'm laying in and the monitors. It features these large glass doors and windows. I can see the warning tape and hazard signs taped to them. Across from my bed is a door to what I assume is a small bathroom. Not long ago, a doctor came in. He was covered head to toe in the most extensive PPE I've ever seen. It was something far more suited to be clearing landmines than talking to a sick patient. When he opened the doors, I could hear the nurses crying. All I could make out was one of the doctors was dead. Between their sobs, I could make out that it had something to do with acid, and the hospital was now in quarantine. The doctor in the bomb suit must have been able to tell I was eavesdropping. He cleared his throat and quickly explained that I have thyroid cancer, the most aggressive form they've ever seen. 
there isn't a cure. Slowly, it was like my hearing dimmed. I could hear the words he was saying, like end-of-life care and will, but I wasn't processing them. He leaned against the bathroom door frame and the door creaked open, revealing something far more shocking than the death sentence I had just received. The doctor must have assumed the news shocked me because he left to find me a pad of paper and a pen to write was supposed to be my last will and testament. The opening of the door revealed a dull, tin-like mirror. What I saw in the mirror, it isn't, wasn't, it's not me. There are thick, throbbing veins all over my face and shoulders. My skin is the molted color of a body that's been floating in the water for days. The mass of my neck is wrapped. It's now large enough it's actually resting on my chest, and I can see where it's oozing the black tar, burning away at the bandages. I don't know how this happened. I don't understand. Even as I write this, I find myself glancing at the mirror, wondering if this is all really happening. I can hear the bandages sizzling. The mass is continuing to grow, and with every pulse I can feel it pressing farther and farther into my windpipe. I'm crying now. I probably have been for a while, but I can see the blood-red tears running down my face in the mirror. There are two large men in black suits standing by the door now. The nurses walk by staring at me, and I can see the tiniest of pulsing knots on their necks. I'm not sure what's happening, I don't know how much time I have, but I do know this isn't cancer. I'm hoping if I seal this in the envelope the doctor gave me and send it to my family, they will share what's happened to me. Something dangerous is going on, and I don't want other people to suffer like me. I know in my heart everyone here isn't going to make it. Even as the blood stains my vision, I can see the panic and desperation in their eyes. I only hope whatever this is won't spread with my letter, and that I haven't exposed anyone else. It's cold now, and I am tired. Maybe if I'm lucky, I'll die in my sleep. Mom, Dad, if you guys get this, I love you. End transcription. On April 30th, 2019, this note was recovered from a military hospital that had been infected with a mysterious plague. Our men recovered this note and various other items from the belongings of patient zero before terminating the staff and remaining patients in the hospital. The hospital was burned down two days later. This copy serves as an official transcription, and the original will be destroyed to prevent any further spread of the plague.